And on your most recent episode at the Late Round Podcast, you touched on a topic that is very near and dear to my fantasy heart about the running back position. It's a, a concept widely known as the running back dead zone. And the loose translation for everybody, running backs drafted in rounds three to six, about that range, have very bad hit rates. Talking like the percentage of running backs drafted in those rounds to score 200 fantasy points, the likelihood of them scoring 250 fantasy points, and so on. And it's so glaring that the hit rates are comparable to running backs drafted in, say, rounds seven through nine or so. On top of that, the wide receiver position has spectacular hit rates in this exact range of the fantasy draft. So it's it's where a good portion of the breakout wide receivers every season are coming from in that three to six round range. So, JJ, feel free to correct or expand on any of that. Um, but I would love to get your take on how many running backs do you think kind of end up in front of that dead zone cliff? Is it 15 or 20? And also, are you comfortable with basically a modified zero RB strategy, like heading into the seventh round of a draft with just one, one running back on your roster? Yeah, so, you know, it depends on on your league and the scoring and all that kind of stuff. Like, if you're in a standard scoring league, there's no need to go zero RB. But if you're in a if you're in a, uh, a typical three wide receiver, flex, full PPR type format, uh, yeah, I mean, I go modified zero RB. Uh, I, I usually don't go full on zero RB, but I'll, I'll go modified zero RB in probably 80 to 90% of my drafts. That's just the what the math shows. Uh, and, you know, you hit on it a lot uh, with, with uh, I, I, I looked at last season, I did an article, or last offseason, I did an article in, in a podcast on uh, where we find league winning players in fantasy football. Um, and, and I won't get into the specific numbers of everything or anything like that. But basically what I did was I mapped out over the last decade where uh, uh, there were clear drop-offs uh, looking at postseason results at running back and wide receiver uh, at each position, at, at both of those positions. And it was very clear that after the RB10, uh, there was a big drop-off. And then after the wide receiver eight, there was a big drop-off. So I used that as the, the baseline for being league-winning players, which you can use league-winning in a lot of different ways. It's just the way that I defined it for the purposes of this article. So the question I asked was, where do we draft top eight wide receivers and top 10 running backs? Uh, and, and what I found was top eight wide receivers are being drafted at a higher rate in the early rounds than top 10 running backs are being drafted in the early rounds. Uh, and if you look at it, the rate in getting a league winning running back uh, in round six versus round four, this is just random, but it's just a, a good example. Over the, over this time frame is from 2011 through 2019 round six versus round four, you've had a higher rate of hitting on a league winning running back in round six than you have in round four over the last eight or nine years. Um, and so if you look at round four and five, uh, the rate in hitting uh, on one of those players is basically completely comparable to, to round six through eight. Uh, so there's really no reason to get a running back in that range unless you feel, you know, I'm not, I'm not someone who says absolutely never do this. You know, it's, it's a strategy mm -hmm. thing, right? Strategy is to increase your probability, not to just go blindly doing something. Like I liked uh, James Conner and Jonathan Taylor in that zone this year. Hit on Jonathan Taylor, didn't hit on James Conner. Uh, that's going to happen. But I also largely avoided, like I had no Todd Gurley. You know, I had no, uh, just a lot of the guys that were in that range in general who just busted this year, right? Um, and so th that's, that's basically the gist of it. And I, I think that the reason this exists you know, again, I always, every every time I find something in data, I try to find if there's a logical reason for this happening. And I try to hypothesize as to why. And so I think with this, with the running back thing, we know every year that there are, let's say, five to seven, five to eight running backs, sometimes more, because you could you could stretch a little bit, but that, that have true, true workhorse bell cow workloads in store, right? This year, usually they're all drafted in the top six or seven. Um, but even this past year, you could get down to like an Aaron Jones in the second round and you could say, yeah, I see it at least. At least he has the receiving component, right? So what happens is, is that we know that running backs are very, very important in fantasy football. And so when people go wide receiver or tight ends early, they get to round three and four and five and they say, well, crap, I need a running back. And so what they do is they just reach and they force that running back pick. Uh, and that devalues the position where you're getting guys that are in more questionable situations than you otherwise would. Uh, so you're getting guys like a Todd Gurley where we don't know what his workload's really going to gonna look like. We we get a guy like David Johnson where we don't know exactly what his workload's going to look like. 
Uh, and, and a lot of times these guys are good early down runners, uh, but they don't necessarily have a receiving component to their game or they're in a split backfield and they're in a committee like Cam Akers. And we're just guessing that they're going to be the lead guy. I know that Cam Akers emerged down the stretch, but Cam Akers was not a good fantasy asset this year. Totally. So that's, that's generally what happens. I think it's just more of a psychological thing where, you know, fantasy managers are sitting there and they're forcing the issue and getting a running back and they're creating reasons as to why they should get that guy. But realistically, you're better off just waiting till round six, seven, or eight because you're going to have a similar hit rate as you will in round three, four, and five. Well, more so four and five than round three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I like what you said, like not making it uh, black and white. Like what I usually do is find that point in my rankings for running back, say it's running back 17 or whatever, and that's kind of my cliff. You know what I mean? Like this is my clear tier break. Right into the next uh, Skeletors that I don't want. And I agree that usually there is pretty glaring uh, issues with them. And I also think people get worried about, yeah, getting too far in a draft and also worrying that they, like, they don't really realize that you can stockpile and, and you can uh, hit on hit rates by doing exactly that, like having three in that range. So you're really playing the math at that point. Maybe I'm trying too hard to make connections here, JJ, but because we like to attack our draft, in a specific way. Is there any chance some of the quarterback trends we've hit on uh, end up conflicting with wanting to stockpile running backs and say that six to ninth round range? As in, as in we're going to change and, and get uh, quarterbacks earlier. And then as a result, um, yeah, I mean, it could, it could, we, we could see a, a slight difference. I mean, the thing is too, you know, one, one of the things that I've really been like thinking because, uh, because tight ends and there's a, there's such a clear tight end tier at the top, right. With, with a, a Kelsey, a Waller, Kittle, um, and and what I'm what I'm seeing is that uh, sure you can get your running back early, but then there's going to be a very very clear uh, line that you draw right to where you feel fine not getting a running back and getting a tight end instead. But then on top of that, at the wide receiver position, you know we are seeing despite Devonte Adams season, despite you know Tyree Kill season and what have you, we are seeing flatter distribution at wide receiver. Um, and so what that means is the opportunity cost in getting those guys earlier is a little bit, and this is what I, I could have brought up too with quarterbacks, but the opportunity cost in getting those guys earlier, it's a little bit easier to take on, right? Because you're not missing out on a running back that you that you really, really want. And you know that wide receiver does have a little bit more depth, even though it's overstated. Uh, it does have a little bit more depth than uh, it has traditionally, which means you're not really foregoing a huge, huge opportunity and missing out on that wide receiver. So as a result... You know, you can feel a little bit better about taking on tight end more in particular, but but maybe a quarterback too. Yeah, I mean, it, it could it could shift the way that you you sort of uh, view drafts from that perspective. 